Calling this multifamily 101, like we said, dry run, let's just roll with it here. So who is this guy? Again, my name is Jeff Younglove. We've been investing in real estate for about 15 years, mainly single family homes. My wife drug me into this, kicking and screaming, because I thought all this was a get rich quick scheme. Um, but after doing a lot of research and learning about it, um, we started buying houses and rentals and started flipping houses. And then we started figuring out uh, more about the multifamily business and kind of learning the ins and out and uh, started investing there. So currently have half a dozen single family homes and invest in half a dozen apartments right now. Um, again, we're gonna talk about the basics of how multifamily investing works. I'm gonna try to keep it as simple as possible because I've only got about 15, 20 minutes. Um, wanna make it relatable and kind of have some fun, all right? So if what we're looking at is why to invest in real estate. We're gonna go over a few key terms and formulas. Like I said, I can't promise there won't be any math here, but there will be a little bit of math. But like I said, we'll try to keep it simple. Um, I wanna do a quick talk about single family versus multifamily, since a lot of people only have experience with single family and try to show the similarities and differences. Um, hit on the NOI, cap rate, do a little income value correlation and hit some fun stuff, uh, and then a little wrap up there. So. It's kind of like the game of craps in my mind. Does anybody play craps out there? Yeah. It's kind of one of those things where you see the game played and you don't know what's going on. It confuses the heck out of you. And then once you learn a little bit more and you actually sit down and play, it all kind of makes sense and then it gets real simple. And that's kind of how I relate it to myself. So um, for those of you who want to learn how to play craps, I'll be teaching in the back corner after the session is over. But <laughs> all right. Why do we invest in real estate? Um, I stole this slide from Darwin, but it's for all those 350 reasons you see up there. But actually, we invest in real estate because... That's all right. It is the ideal investment, right? You get income from the cash flow. I know several of us in here, including my, myself, get checks every month um, from wonderful Darwin Corp out there. Um, you get the depreciation on the asset, which helps offset your taxes, so we end up paying no taxes. Um, equity capture for when you buy a depressed property or something under value and then you buy it and raise the value through forced appreciation, which is fixing it up and making it worth more. For those of you guys who've been in the business for a while now or done the multifamily, we've seen prices and stuff go up considerably um, in the last several years um, just through the market rising. Uh, and then there's leverage, you know, basically being able to use the bank's money versus your own on that. And then control, which to me was when I first got into this and started figuring it out. The control piece was big to me because I don't know if anybody here had ever invested in Enron or anything like that, but I think when it was torpedoing and going down, I don't think anybody felt like they had any control whatsoever what was going on. All right, I'm gonna go over a few key terms and formulas here. You don't have to memorize these, but they're just important to know. Um, as we go through here, I'm gonna have them presented as we talk about them later so you don't have to write them down. Value, what the apartment complex is worth. Pretty straightforward. NOI, which stands for net operating income, it's basically the income remaining after you've paid all of your operating expenses. Cap rate, strictly speaking, is a potential rate of return on the investment if paying 100% cash on the investment. It gets a little weirder when you start looking into the cap rate and how it shifts around and stuff, but those are the basic starting off points for those. And then the formulas, for any of you who have been in many multifamily classes before, you've seen these probably 100 times, they've called different names, but there's your basic formulas for how you calculate value, NOI divided by cap rate. NOI is value times cap rate, and cap rate is NOI divided by value. For any of you math majors out there, you see they're all related and all tied to each other and all that. And again, I've got some examples in here to kind of show this all out. Single family versus multifamily. Who here has ever bought a house that they own and live in? I'm sure, I don't have everybody here. How did y'all figure out how much you were gonna pay for that house? If you're, if you're like me, my wife told me how much we were paying for the house, and that's what we paid for the house. But yes, comps. It's what the house next door sold for compared to what kind of amenities they had. Did they have granite countertops and a pool? Did they have hardwood floors and things like that? And you based your decision off of the houses in the neighborhood and, and what they were selling for and how much you wanted to pay for those amenities and things. Obviously fixed up homes, sell for more than run down homes because they're more desirable. <clears throat> when it comes to multifamily investing though, the value of the apartment or the multifamily property is based entirely on the income, essentially. Now amenities and things like that obviously can raise the income and can raise the value of the property, but it doesn't necessarily matter what the one next door sold for, the one across the street sold for. It's what income it derives 
from, basically. So if you're thinking about multifamily investing and multifamily purchases, you're basically buying an income stream. You know, you pay money for this property and you're buying the income it produces. So just something I want to clarify for those who are you know, kind of new to this. Here's a nice example of Young Love Vistas. It is a nice apartment I own with, I'm just kidding, I just took a picture off the internet, but. <laughs> um, yes, nice and run down, looking very well, but if we want to do a little sample of some of the math we showed a second ago, we'll do some, do some samples here. So the cap rate calculation, as we talked about before, is NOI minus overvalue. So if you look at scenario one and assume Young Love Vistas has an NOI of 150 grand, the value of five million, you do the math for the cap rate, 150 over five million, your cap rate is a three. It's technically 0.03, but you just say a cap, three cap. Uh, value, again, looking at the formula again, take a different scenario. If the NOI was 100 grand, your cap rate's a 10. You do the math, you now have a value of a million, right? And then lastly, from an NOI perspective, the value of three million, you live, your property is in a cap rate seven, 3 million divided by 7 is 210 grand. So this is basically how the formulas worked, is very simply. Makes sense? I mean, it's pretty straightforward stuff so far. Well, speaking of NOI, let's talk about NOI for a little bit. <clears throat> so NOI is defined strictly as the net operating income, right? Which is all the operating income minus all the operating expenses. Great. What the heck does that mean, right? <laughs> all the operating income is basically all the income you derive from your operations. It's typically all the rent, obviously, laundry fees you charge, if you have covered parking that you charge extra for, anything like that on the property that you're able to charge and derive income from, that counts in the operating income side of the house. Operating expenses is everything associated with running the property. It's the management company, it's fixing the gutters, it's insurance, taxes, things like that that you have to pay uh, to run the property. The one thing you want to remember, though, when it comes to the NOI is that paying your mortgage, the debt service, does not count. They don't count that in the formula. So that was one thing that I was confused about when I first started looking at this was do you or do you not count that? And the main reason why you don't is because it's not technically an operating expense. You don't have to get a mortgage to buy a, 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 uh, an apartment. You can pay all cash for an apartment if you want to. Now, because of the leverage we talked about before where you want to use other people's money, it's a good idea to do it but you don't have to, so it doesn't count as an operating expense. Now what about cash flow? Well, cash flow is the NOI like we talked about before, minus all of those operating expenses like the debt service, the mortgage. You actually take the mortgage out of it. You take off your CapEx expenditures that you put into the bucket there to pay for when your roof goes out or something like that. So this is the money that you use, well I use, to go buy lottery tickets and Jack Daniels when I get the check from Darwin or things like that. Uh, you'd use it how you want, but that's... We good? Make sense? Any questions? Ah, all right. Good crowd. Next we're going to talk about cap rate, and this is the one I think that gets most people spun up and confused and stuff. So we'll spend a little bit of time on this and we'll go through some fun examples to try to help spell it out. But basically the cap rate, you have cap rates at the market level, sub-market and properties. And when I say market, I mean, let's say Arlington. Arlington can have a cap rate, let's say it's eight. But the neighborhood you're looking at, the sub-market may have a cap rate of seven, for example. And the property you're actually evaluating, if you want to buy it, could have a cap rate of 6.7. It's almost like when you see gas prices on the news and they say the national average of gas is $2.75, but maybe in your neighborhood it's $2.50. So just something to keep in mind when you see things like cap rate thrown around. They have different, you know, areas that they, uh, for markets and sub-markets. It's basically a rule of thumb, though, for just tracking how the market's performing. If you're looking in certain areas and you see a cap rate 6 in one area and 5s and 7s, and it used to be maybe 8s, 9s, and 10s, it kind of just gives you an indication of how that market is performing compared to the past there. This is the one that blew my mind here was the lower the cap rate, the higher the value of the apartment, the higher the cap rate, the lower the value of the apartment. To me, that seemed completely opposite. If you talk about cap rate being a rate of return, let's say, to me, the higher that number goes, I would think the higher the value, but it actually is the opposite. So just remember that. I'll show you in a second why. The other thing to think about is it has multiple perspectives um, from the cap rate. As a buyer, I want to try to get the cap rate, justify a high cap rate when I'm buying a property because that means it's a lower value. 
Whereas if I'm a seller, I want to try to justify a lower cap rate because then I can sell it for higher. And if you're trying to buy a property, you don't know if the person selling it is using actual numbers to come up with a cap rate. Are they using pro forma? Are they using projections? Are they writing it down on a napkin? So you, you really have to kind of understand that because of how people can manipulate it and use it to suit their needs, it is a helpful metric and important to keep track of, but it's not something that is end-all, be-all, overall metric that tells, tells you the world, right? I've had people ask me what the cap rate was on one of my single-family rentals. Uh, I don't know, I make 500 bucks a month on it. That's, that's the metric I keep track of. So um, return on investment is really the key here, and that's what, when Darwin will do his evaluations and look at properties, he'll use cap rate and things like that to help do the overall analysis, but when it comes down to it, does it return on investment, you know, cash in real investment within the parameters we want to invest in, or is it not a good deal, right? All right, so let's do one quick example on the cap rate here and kind of show you guys a little bit of why the lower cap rate, higher value and opposite there, because this was the one, again, you guys may get it all and it makes complete sense to you, but to me, I, I got in arguments with people trying to explain why this is real until I actually sat down and, and worked it out. So let's take a quick example here. <clears throat> Year one, I have an NOI of 100 grand, cap rate 10%, value equals NOI divided by cap rate, million dollars. Makes sense, right? Well, let's say then I jump in my DeLorean and I go forward in time five years, right? Doc Brown picks me up, 88 miles an hour. We are now five years in the future. And here's what the property is doing now. I know I'm still 100 grand. That's not very good. I don't know who's been running the property, but they haven't been doing a very good job. Thanks, Darwin. Um, <laughs> cap rate's 5%. Um, value now is 2 million. So nothing changed as far as the, val uh, the NOI. NOI stayed the same, but the cap rate dropped because the market improved. So my value went from $1 million to $2 million, right? So cap rate went down, value went up. And the reason why is in year one, you had to, to get a $100,000 return, you had to invest $1 million. <coughs> in year five, to get that same $100,000 return, and the return we're talking about is the NOI, because that's the money that you're, you're basically getting back, right? In year five, to get that same 100 grand return, you now have to invest $2 million, right? So does that kind of make sense? As the NOI goes, um, as the cap rate goes down, the value goes up because to, to get that same return in dollars, you have to spend more money into the property. So that's why, you know, if you say it's a rate of return, well, sure, the cap rate went down, so your return for that same amount of money went down. Does that kind of make sense? Again, I know it's a little convoluted, um, but the way I look at it is, assuming I have the same rate of same return, $100,000 of your NOI, I have to put in more money to get that same amount of return, which is why the cap rate goes down. You all right? <laughs> this, stuff is, this stuff is powerful, man. <laughs> it's exciting stuff. Um, any questions? I know this is somewhat convoluted. Yeah. If I can't answer them, Jeremy will answer them. So. Now, every year, mm -hmm. from year one to year five, won't the rent go up every year? Absolutely. And this is just, to, I wanted to do an example where only one thing changed and it was the cap rate. You would assume the NOI is going to go up along with it because you're getting more rents and all that kind of stuff. But the only reason I did this was just to show the only thing changing is the cap rate going down, which leads to the, uh, the rise in income. Absolutely. Or value, I mean. Yes. But then again, you could be a terrible property manager and never raise rents in five years. And yeah. <laughs> No? Okay. Yeah, go for it. Is, is this in a flyer or something that you guys have today? Is it, is it okay if I take pictures when you took over? Yeah. Oh. Nope. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Jeremy on the ball. Was this in a flyer? Jeremy handed a flyer. You can find this information on the website as well for those of you online right now. So, All right, we'll keep moving on again. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them afterwards. If you have suggestions, feel free to let me know. All right. One thing we want to point out is this is actually similar to what we're seeing in today's market. Not the NOI is not going up, but the fact that properties you could get three or four years ago at, I don't know, $30,000 per door, let's say, for an apartment, are now double that at this point. The market is rising, values are going up, incomes are going up too, but it's getting more and more and more expensive and tougher to find good deals just as the market has gone up. This, even in the single family market, if anybody's been shopping for houses lately, you know it's ridiculous out there. So. 
All right, fun stuff. I promise you there'll be fun stuff. To me, this is the fun stuff. Ignore those two arrows because I didn't hide them properly when I formatted the PowerPoint, but just, <laughs> they're gonna point to some exciting stuff. Just get ready for that, all right? So some of you who've been here before, you've heard Darwin talk about the $1 increase in NOI equals a $14.28 increase in value, right? Remember we said if your NOI goes up, which is your income, your value should go up as well, right? Well, how does that work? I know that I had to do a little math on this to figure it out, but here's how it basically works. On the left, I have an NOI of 100 grand, cap rate of seven, which is the cap rate we use for this example. Your value is, good Lord, 1,428,571.43. Now, because I'm such an awesome manager, I have worked on this property for years, and on the right, it has gone up by $1 on the NOI, if you see, from 100,000 to 100,000, $1. So we've added $1 to NOI. You do the math, you get that really long number, and I'll save you the math, but if you do that, the difference is $14.28, right? So just doing the math, it works. Okay, great, $14, I can, go buy, I can go buy lunch. I used to be able to buy two lunches, but now I can buy one lunch. Well, let's make this a little more realistic and something that I actually can feel. This is, the, this is what got me. When I did the math and figured this out, this really got me. So let's assume you have one vacant unit in a 100 unit apartment complex. And it rents for $700 a month and the submarket cap, the cap rate seven. Well, how much money are we losing on the value of the property just from this one vacant unit? Well, $700, $700 a month, 12 months equals $8,400 in lost NOI. We can do the math there, right? Anybody want to take a guess real quick what the lost, not you, Jeremy, that the lost uh, value is on this? Pretty close. 120 grand, 120 grand. One unit that you have vac vacant in this scenario, 120 grand in value. That's mind blowing to me. Now imagine you've got a 100 unit apartment complex and it's at 85% occupancy. You wanna get 10 more units to get it to 95% occupancy. Those 10 units that you are not renting out, that's 1.2 million in value you're missing out on just from the sake of not having those rented. That's huge to me. I mean, 1.2 million, holy cow. <laughs> holy cow, yes. To me, this was like the golden thing. When I figured this out and just, you know, I've, had, I've invested in other properties outside of Darwin and you look at some of the numbers and you look at the vacancies and you think, eh, it's just a couple units aren't rented. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like that big a deal. You'll get around to it. And then you start looking at this stuff and realize, holy cow, this stuff actually adds up to big stuff real quick. Put them teenage high school kids in there, pay their rent and you're better off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Questions, this kind of makes sense. Again, I know for some of you who are new, this may be a little bit, you know, still working your brain. For those who've seen this before, you're probably surfing the internet on your phone. That's fine as well. <laughs> All right, so just some final thoughts here to kind of wrap up. The multifamily, if you're gonna have some key takeaways, here you go. Multifamily value is driven off the income. The more you, the income goes up, the more the value goes up typically, right? Um, NOI is what our standard term or metric for income, higher NOI, increase in value. Cap rate, well, a good metric for evaluating the market, but its importance is overstated and, and kind of thrown around a lot where you know, people use it at parties. What's your cap rate? What's your cap rate? Eh, it doesn't, yeah. Actual rate of return is the key metric when evaluating investments, obviously. When we make any decision in life, we typically base it off of the rate of return, whether it's buying a sandwich or buying a car or whatever it is. I mean, that's, that's, whether it's in your brain just thought out or whether it's actually formulatic and you actually do the calculations. As we just saw, small changes in income or occupancy can have a big change in the results. And then real estate investing is an ideal way to reach financial freedom. And I know that sounds very corny, that last line there, but for coming from a guy who was, that guy's just trying to rip me off at these seminars or whoever it is, I can't tell you how much, I could have bought two cars with the money we spent on seminars. I don't regret it because it got me where I am now, but I truly believe that this is the way to go and this is the way to get to your passive income and to where you can actually live the life you want to when you can go on vacations whenever you feel like. So thank you all very much. I hope you uh, appreciate it and bear with me on this first pass through here. Thank you. <laughs> now it's your turn to take over this. Thank you, Jeff. You got your celebrity in there. Now we'll go through a quick State of the Union. We have a lot of big things going on this year. Okay, and obviously you all can read everything and uh, 
management updates, expanding the team, software updates, better reporting, direct deposit of distributions. You want to see that? Okay. Uh, properties we're selling, properties that we're refinancing, what we're buying, developing, and uh, even, uh, even a way to add some liquidity possibly to the whole market as far as being able to uh, buy and sell sh your shares easier, okay? First thing, property management. Um, you remember me talking about centralized versus decentralized management, correct? Does anybody remember that? Okay, can I see a hand if you remember that? Thank you. I just wanna make sure I'm talking to live people. Um, and I have wanted to make changes and have been requesting those from the management company for over a year. And also there's performance issues that I haven't been happy with, things like that. Because I want in decentralized, each property kind of stands on its own and the manager has more decision-making ability. Right now being centralized, all the decisions come from a corporate office, which is not as efficient as it can be done on site with those managers. Now, the big problem with that is you need to have more support for those managers to go that direction, okay? So in doing that, it's a completely different paradigm. It's a paradigm shift for the management side. And for that, we could not use Walker Holder to do that job anymore. So we are switching away from Walker Holder and going with U.S. Property Company, which is Ken Barjam, our asset manager's company that he has for our management. So that's a change that we just gave Walker Holder yesterday, and we will be transitioning officially on March 1st. Okay. First, does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Because that is actually a big deal. Just so you know, changing management companies is a pain. It is a, it is a difficult thing to do and not something you go into lightly. Okay. But it's going, the bottom line, everything that we do, we try to do to say what is best for the investors. What's going to make them more money? What's going to protect the asset the most? What's going to do better for you guys? So after trying to work with Walker Holder on doing this, it wasn't going to work out that way. So we're switching over to Ken's management company. Yes, sir. We are, we ex okay, the question is, are we retaining on-site personnel? Now, more important than the management company is the on-site personnel, okay? We have to have the right people, especially decentralizing everything. They need to be a little bit uh, more in tune with everything. So we are counting on retaining probably 90% of the on-site staff, okay? We want to make sure that they're not poached and going somewhere else. So Ken is being very proactive at talking it to all of the properties and the staff on all the properties to make sure that there's good relationship and they know the transition's coming. And from their point of view, they're just looking for job security. Anytime there's a change, they get worried that they're going to be terminated when a property sells or management changes, things like that, they worry. Okay, so we're managing all of those aspects, just so you know. Okay, Walker Holder, I've got no problems with them whatsoever. They've been a great management company for them. We just think that we can operate more efficiently by switching the way that we're doing it. Okay, the emails will follow up. We'll get the, the concerns later on. Yes, sir. As far as your management software, are you going to stick with the Resmin? We're still sticking with the same management software, still using Resmin, yes. I'm assuming that's correct. We've discussed that, that we are staying with that, so it wasn't an assumption, but I wanna make sure that was correct. Okay, just so you know, there's some team changes then, obviously, because Walker Holder's not there. So just to give you a list of everybody. Um, first off, Kelly, stand up. This is my wife, Kelly. Okay, and she is obviously, uh, besides being my wife and the better looking one of the two of us, she's also the smarter one of the two of us when it comes to property management. She's done, done it for 25 years, so she is uh, right there with me as far as knowing uh, how to manage it and giving uh, a lot of input on everything. Brian Johnson, everybody knows Brian, even though they've never met him, he's the, he's the, the man behind the screen. 
because he lives in Colorado and he is our uh, in-house general counsel and he's the one that actually handles a lot of the work on the partnership level. Jeremy, always wearing a pink or green shirt. And everybody knows Jeremy because he's the gatekeeper. If you want to do any investing, anything else, that all goes through Jeremy. Brian Holly, wave Brian. Okay, for those of you who don't know Brian back there in the blue shirt, he is uh, the project director and a partner on uh, Riverbend. Okay, you've, you've received the emails if you're a partner on that regarding the progress of that property and it's been going very good and a lot of that is because he is there on site every day virtually every day and he has one focus and that's one property at a time now that that one has transitioned now his focus right now is brookside okay so he's going to be an individual project director on individual projects ken has to overlook the whole portfolio that way, Brian is right there driving that one. Our, our supervisor, everybody else is on numerous properties. That way, we have one person that's really pushing getting everything done on that property. Of course, you met Je uh, Jeff. You know, you know, <laughs> I don't think you need to stand up. You were just up here for 15 minutes. Um, but uh, Jeff wants to be more involved and more active. And he's helped on giving some suggestions as far as how the meeting should go and be a little more effective for you guys. So if you have any other suggestions regarding how the meeting should go or what we should do, not do, things you wanna see, please tell Jeff, okay? Um, Kai, wave Kai. Okay, Kai's been doing our digital marketing back there in the corner, okay? He's been doing the Facebook ads. Have you seen any of the videos? Has anybody seen any videos? Please tell me somebody has, for God's sake. Okay, first off, we're taking everything that we're doing and between Kai and Mo up here of operating the camera, they are taking everything we do and putting it on videos and it's actually on YouTube, okay? So you can go on there and listen, so it's free education. My whole thought process is give everything away for free so that you can learn and get all that information just like you would where you're paying for it, okay? So we're doing all that and I'm investing money in that so that you can have more learning opportunities as well. Julian, everybody, now a lot of people know Julian. Can, Hold can, on a second. Can we guess what the YouTube channel is called? Uh, it's probably, uh, what is the YouTube channel called? Darwin German Real Estate Investments. Darwin German Real Estate Investments. <laughs> it's original, it's unique. <laughs> One of a kind. Okay. Um, Julian, every, people know Julian, he's, uh, he's been working on acquisitions to find whatever properties we, uh, everything that we're looking for, he's looking at every deal that he can find and constantly talking to the brokers so that he can keep his, ta his finger on the pulse of all the deals that are trading um, and so that we can make sure between he and I that nothing gets missed or overlooked. Ken Barjam, let's go ahead and stand up, Ken, just so that everybody can see who you are still. He's been our asset manager, now the management company. Okay, so he's the one that's gonna lower our expenses and make the property operate better to increase the NOI, which increases the value of the property, and makes us all more money. Okay, so he's the one that gets uh, accolades for that part. And Dillard, I wanna point out Dillard. Stand up here, Dillard. Okay. Turn around so everybody can see you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Dillard is a partner and a financial analysis guru, and he's working with Ken on the property management side. And he has put together some great reports so that we can get even drill down in more detail on all the properties, which what those reports do is allow us to better manage the properties. Okay, so as far as the details, Diller's the right guy for that. Okay. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> Who's an investor in Pioneer Creek? Okay. Well, are we technically... Te you still right now are, yes. Technically, you are still a partner in Pioneer Creek. In the LLC that is. Okay. This is the worst seller I've ever dealt with in my life. Okay. We put this deal under contract in June. Okay, to give you an example, as soon as we put it under contract, 
He stopped doing maintenance, stopped doing leasing, stopped doing make readies. He even stopped trashing out units when they moved out. Okay. So now we have 50 vacant units as opposed to the 12 when we put it under contract that no work has been done on. We uh, were negotiating, part of that delay was negotiating an insurance claim on the roof that we thought we would get enough funds to replace the roof and he didn't want to do it. And it was a big bicker back and forth. He didn't want to file a claim because it was going to in increase his rates on all of his other properties and we finally agree on it. Somebody tells him that it's a million dollar claim and he can make money on it. All that is bottom line uh, crapped out because he has a $250,000 deductible on his insurance claim. So there's a, a chance we might get a little bit of money but not the amount of money we anticipated because of a $250,000 deductible, it's horrible. He had a fire and the insurance proceeds came and he decided to cash those rather than sign it over to his lender. Um, so no matter what, we're gonna have to do a modification of the private placement memorandum because we either get the concession and plan on spending, actually I missed a step. Let me throw in one more step on this. When we originally put this under contract, we had a CapEx budget of X, okay? I think it was 1.4, 1.4. Now with the roof situation and the deferred maintenance and the vacant units and the decision really to uh, make the product even better to achieve the rents we want, we have raised that CapEx budget to $2,850,000. Okay, so we need some type of concession from him. Now I'm not gonna get a million 450 out of him. That will not fly whatsoever, okay? So we're gonna need additional capital to close the transaction if we're assuming his loan. What that does, okay, and we'll have, no, once we can get all the numbers situated, I'll have a better email for you, but I just wanna get it all out there so you can hear everything. If we raise additional capital, which we're talking about another million, million one, something like that, I forget exactly what it is, then we still have a good refinance, which we were talking about refinancing that value add and pulling 40 to 45% out on our refi. That is still a possibility. The problem is that our overall per year return is lowered, okay? I already thought it was pretty low anyway, but it seems that everybody likes it because of the value add, okay? The other option is we say, we go back and renegotiate, have him pay off the loan, which there's a $750,000 prepayment penalty, which is why we were assuming the loan in the first place. And we go through and get a new loan, roll that extra, all the CapEx into that onto the purchase price, what that does though is A, it will delay us another, uh, another month. It will lower our capital requirements, meaning that for those of you who don't wanna be in it or however we do that, but we would need less capital than we currently have collected, which was 6.1, we'd need more like 4.1. The refinance that we were talking about doing, that amount goes down to 25 to 30% as opposed to 45 or 50. But the overall five year yield goes to an average of about 20% per year. Okay. That being said, this is something that I don't understand from your point of view. Okay. From my point of view, sacrifice it's a much better option to sacrifice the short-term refinance so that you can have 20% per year growth on the money over five years. That's the choice that I personally would pick knowing what I know now, okay? So either way, we're gonna have to do a supplement to the PPM. In doing that, you can have your money back, you can get out, you can do whatever you want, 
And again, you always could. We've had a couple of people that said this is taking too damn long and want their money back already, which we we can wire that back to you immediately. Okay, so that's where we are in Pioneer. Okay, for the people that are in Pioneer, how many say kill it? Okay, no hands. For the people that are in Pioneer, how many say raise additional capital so that we can have a better refi? Anybody? Get, be brave, please. I can't see, I can only see two hands. The question is, have I run the numbers to uh, see which is a better option? Yes, I have, but I've got too many variables because I don't know the deal that I'll negotiate with him yet. Okay, so these are ballpark numbers based on the information I have right now. Okay, so there's two people that said, yes, keep the higher refinance amount. Of the Pioneer partners who say, go ahead and do it and get new debt. Okay, was well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, all right, good. That's again, that's just a that's not an official vote. So just FYI. You know, one other piece of information would be interesting is what are you looking at as far as a minimum concession? What am I looking at as far as a minimum concession? It all depends on how the numbers work out. Quite honestly, I'm gonna ask for seven fifty, maybe a million, somewhere in there. Not and I'm not going to say anything else now that I realize that <laughs> it is being broadcast. Okay. Go figure. Can you uh, remind me? The, hey, Al. The, the, the loan is to be assumed, or could be assumed, is approximately what percentage of the purchase price? Is? The loan is $5.8 million. Maybe it's $5.6 million. Yeah, roughly half. Of it. And the purchase price right now is $9,750. So it's a low loan to value as far as the assumption, which is why we can do a supplemental and get so much of our money back. Okay. Now we're still paying, okay, who has a calculator? Uh, $9,750,000 divided by 213. $750,000 divided by two. What? No, uh, $9,750,000. Divided by 213. For thank you. The broker does it for us. Okay, forty-five thousand dollars a door. So we're still talking about buying a nice property, not gorgeous, it's still a C plus property, at forty-five thousand dollars a door right in the middle of Arlington. Okay, that's obviously not run well. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of upside in that. Okay, so, so that's where the opportunity is. Um, okay, so the next thing is Al, come on up. We've got another special guest here. This is Al Silva with Marcus and Millichap. Okay, and yay, oh, thanks for coming. I'm going to stand next to you, Al. So come on up here for an okay. interview because I've got all these microphones. I don't want to switch around. Sure. Thanks okay. For me. Um, we have listed Woodwind for sale. Okay. And that rolled out when? Uh, today. That rolled out today. Okay. And so Woodwind, any partners of Woodwind in here? Ooh, one. Congratulations. Okay. For everybody else, we have a property for sale. <laughs> But uh, Woodwind has uh, additional land. The big reason we're selling that one is we had additional land and we were going to develop that, which was going to cause a reduction of our expenses. What happens when expenses get reduced? NOI goes up, NOI, NOI goes up and value goes up. Well, by bu building new units, we could lower the expenses on the existing property quite a bit which would increase the value of our own property just because of having the other units. Now, just so you know, we have went through, we had an equity partner who was putting up the money to go ahead and do it. We have drawings, we have soil samples, we have construction bids. We're, you know, this close to being able to do it, but it's going to take raising. Uh, they decided they did not want to put up the money for that. And it, so it was going to take three or $4 million to build it. 
And uh, in all honesty, I don't have any, I don't have any experience building, and I want that experience. How many units? Uh, Eighty-four units is what we we're going to add, plus debt. That that was the cash. There was also debt. So uh, as far as building those, that they were going to put up, that they have decided not to go that direction, and. We are about tapped out on our, how tapped out are we on our rents? Is there a little bit of rent upside? I think there's some rent upside left, but I think it's gonna take some additional capital to put okay. into the project. Okay, so, and that's normal broker speak, so that there's always capital that has to go in there, and there's always room to raise the rents, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> it's okay, Al's one of my favorite brokers, so I, and how many deals have we done? Six or seven now. Six or seven. So he brings a lot of deals to the table. Him bringing us deals and helping us get deals is what has made you money. So he's another one of the favorite guys in the room for you guys. Okay. So tell us about Woodwind and your marketing and what you're going to do and what we expect. Sure. Well, first of all, I'll say thank you for having me and thanks for being a you know, favorite guy in the room. I and mean, that's never happened in my life. So. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Woodwind, you know, we sold the property to you several years ago and done an outstanding job uh, turning the property around, putting capital into it. And so now it's to a point where the market's really strong. The NOI has gone way up. Cap rates have come way down. So the value of the property, in my opinion, is more than doubled since the day we, we sold it to you, which is a an incredible accomplishment. But uh, what we're doing now, I've been with Marcus Millichap 14 years. That's all I do is buy and sell uh, apartment buildings. Or actually, that's all I do is market apartment buildings for a living. And I've been doing it for uh, a long time and Darwin and I have been working <coughs> together a long time. So we hit the market today. Uh, you know, Thousands of emails go out to investors we have relationships with uh, throughout the country. And actually, we're doing uh, deals with foreign investors in some cases now. And so uh, what we're gonna do is focus on maximizing the exposure to qualified investors, bring, you know, get as many eyes on it as we can, uh, get as many people to the property to do tours as we can. That process usually takes about three weeks. We're making phone calls, we're sending emails, we're sending postcards and flyers to, uh, to people. Uh, we're posting it on our, our website. Uh, we're using our, our network uh, of partners and vendors to help us kind of get exposure. So we do these tours and then on, on the offer deadline date, it's called the call for offers date. Everybody submits their offers on the same day. Uh, we sift through those. I'll present a list of them to Darwin, all the offers, and we'll pick a small number of those to go into what we call the best and final round. So who are the best buyers? Who's offering the best price and terms coming into this? And uh, a week later, they'll have to <clears throat> kind of sharpen their pencil, so to speak, you know, put their best foot forward to try to win the deal. And what that does, it helps us create a competitive environment uh, to get the highest possible price with the best possible buyer with the best pos strongest possible terms of execution. Meaning, you know, can we get non-refundable earnest money from day one of contract? Can we get a short due diligence period, a short closing period? And what that does, it increases the probability of closing successfully and it decreases the possibility of getting renegotiated on <coughs> price and terms. So uh, this process we've been honing over many, many years and uh, we feel like we've got it to a, a really good place. So we're excited to be marketing the property and we, we feel really confident that uh, we're gonna go get what we think, so. Okay, is it priced or is it one of those uh, price to market? Okay, so that's, that's something a lot of people are, are used to seeing in today's environment, especially brokers just you know, love putting price to be determined by market. You don't have to really price it. And everybody's used to seeing that, which is fine. Uh, the, the idea is that if you put a number on it, that might limit you. What I've found, you know, Woodwind, we're pricing it. We're putting a price tag on it, uh, which is contrary to uh, a lot of other, uh, what a lot of other brokers are doing right now. And what we're doing personally on the bigger deals, deals that are 10, 15 million and higher, we generally don't put a price in those because those types of you know, investors, they get thrown off if you have a, a price on one of those deals. So, but what we have found is the deals under 10 million, if we put a price on them, these are private individual or small groups of investors that are buying these types of properties. And to have a price tag on it, people, uh, they're automatically more interested in it. They wanna know what's the price per unit? What's my cap rate going in? What's my uh, cash on cash return going in when you put the financing you can get into place? So 
Uh, we're putting a price tag on it because you get, we feel like we get a lot more attention on the market when we can actually market those metrics. Uh, we have one price tag on it as uh, new debt, so somebody can buy it and put new financing on it. Uh, and what that does is allows them the flexibility, you know, as he was just talking about Pioneer Creek, to go get more attractive financing. Uh, the problem is you incur the prepayment penalty, so you have to get a higher price. Uh, and so we're also marketing at a lower price where you can assume the existing loan, meaning you don't have to incur the prepayment penalty uh, and the buyer can buy it at a much lower price, but they're assuming financing that isn't nearly as attractive and they have to put more equity into the deal. So we have it priced as an assumption at 5.75 million at free and clear at 6.6. We're gonna let the market tell us what's gonna net us the most dollars. So people can submit only in, you know, as an assumption, only free and clear, or they can submit both ways, sure. So 6.6, .6, is that how much it's costing to build 84 units? No, 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 the 84 units has nothing to do with any of this. The construction cost on those 84 units would be $120,000 a door. $120 a door? Yeah, and we've got this priced at 6.6 .6 at $103,000 a unit, or 102. Right. Like the building is 120 a door or the, the... Two different things. The property that we have is priced at $102,000 per unit. 102. Okay. If we were to build those other units, those would cost $120,000 per unit, not including the land. To build. To build, correct. Right. How, how big the building, how big are the other units? The new units, I want to say we were at like uh, 800 square foot average. And the existing property is just under 1,000 yeah, square foot. Yeah, the existing average. one. And again, this property was built as condominiums. And we originally purchased 52 of the 64 condos. It was what they call a fractured condo deal. And we bought those 52 units. Then we went out and bought the other 12 units from the individual owners. And uh, we were basically, uh, to do that, we had to be a bit of uh, jerks. And we went in there and said, okay, there's a $5,000 a door special assessment, which you have to pay if you wanna keep owning your property. Uh, if you don't pay it, we foreclose, or we'll buy your apartment from you. Okay, so we went through and did that and bought the, uh, the remaining 12 units. So now it is a regular apart, standard apartment transaction rather than a fractured condo deal. Okay. Right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the market submit their call for offers and their best and final, and we'll evaluate two different offer lists. And we'll say, okay, are we gonna get the most net proceeds selling it as an assumption or as new debt? And which buyers do we like the most uh, under which scenarios? And we'll have to make a decision working together on what nets the best result. But uh, it's interesting. Sometimes the free and clear scenario wins out. Sometimes every now and then the assumption scenario went out. So you, you wanna keep your options open. It keeps the buyer pool bigger. And when the buyer pool's bigger, again, more exposure, more offers, usually means a better sale. Okay, even though we have it priced, do you think we're gonna have offers higher than the price that's listed? In the last 18 months, you know, we've sold about $400 million worth of apartment buildings on my team. How much? And about 400 million. And the average price that we achieve has been about 102% of the asking price, 102.9%, so almost 103%. So, you know, if you're selling a $10 million property, that's 10.3 million, which, you know, that's, that's not so bad. Right, so we, we are, and so even we though it's priced, we we are, we're hoping for it a higher price. It doesn't put a limit on what we're doing because you, know, you get the exposure, you get that competitive environment going, and the price tag is on there. People are willing to pay above asking price uh, to secure a deal. Just like in the residential market, you hear about these houses going above their asking prices. Uh, it's, it's a similar thing, and we don't think, on our team, we don't think that, that it limits what we can do by putting a price tag on it. Okay, and it's a, it's a catch-22 situation. As a seller, I love the process. As a buyer, I hate it, okay? That's how we know we're doing our job. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, and, and he is hired to represent us to get us the best price. So he's, he's on our team on that. 
Um, any other questions for Al since we've got somebody famous in the room here? Yes, sir. This would be for either of you, but as you would look at this, maybe as a potential buyer, what, I mean, Darwin comes in and does a fabulous job, everything looks fantastic. What is there left for a new buyer to anticipate being able to get? I know you think rents might be able to go up, but. Well, here, let, let me rephrase the question also so that they can hear it online. What's the upside on buying that? Sure, sure. Well, that's my job is to sell the upside. And I think if somebody came in with fresh capital, continued the unit upgrade program that Darwin has already put into place on the property, and may, maybe even included some you know, kind of new upgrades that other people in the area have experimented with, I think there is an opportunity to push rents another probably 50 to $75 <coughs> in the next 12 to 18 months. And then on top of that, you also have the development angle. Uh, which a lot of people are very interested in because look, they're paying 103,000 a door. So 120,000 a door, I mean, you're getting fairly close to the replacement cost uh, for those units. And so if you can go build 84 brand new units <coughs> on something that's already zoned, everything's already kind of teed up for you, uh, you not only have the rental upside there, but you also have the, the upside of, of developing and that will help you bring down your operating expenses per door, which is gonna create even more value. So it's to take it to the next level. Sure. Yeah, doesn't the, uh, the only thing that I don't understand is when you buy a property per door, like let's say you buy an older property for 40,000 a door, or 60,000 a door, whatever it is. Right. That includes the land, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, so when you buy a property, it includes the land, yes. So 120,000 for a brand new door, it does not include the land. That is the, the $120,000 per unit that I, that I said for building is just your hard and soft cost. It does not include the purchase of the land because if you buy this property, you already own the land. It's included with it. So that way, all you need to do is spend the extra 120 a door to build on that land, to build those other units. Right. So we're not charging separate price for the land. The land comes with uh, the property. I know, but we're doing 120,000 per door for the building. But we're not doing the construction. Oh, we're not. That has nothing to do with it. That was the original plan was to build on that. But we are past setting that aside and using that as upside for whoever the new buyer is. So we are not building anything on that. Oh, we're just selling with the We're land. just selling it with the opportunity for them to build on that land. Yes. Yes, sir. Just to continue on this same thing, but not to muddy the waters. If you do, did build it at $120, what kind of rent differential do you think you could get between I want to say that the rents, I don't know what, I don't know what they are in his package, um, but I would assume that rents, I'm going completely off of memory here, so this is like an oral exam without any prep. Um, I think that our rents right now, or at least our projector rents, are about a buck 23 a foot. And on the new construction, we projected a dollar 35 a foot. But you've also got to remember, that our current units are average 1,000 square feet. So the rent per square foot would be a little bit lower anyway. Whereas smaller units, smaller it is, the higher per square foot it is. So $1.35 is a very attainable um, rent for brand new construction. No problem. Any other questions? Well, thank you for coming on out. Sure. Al, I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Darwin. No yeah, problem. Thank you, oh, oh, wait, wait. Oh. I want you to do one more thing. Okay because we are buyers. We see all these people out here that have money and want to buy something. Um, do you have anything coming up we need to look at? Yes, I do. Uh, we've got uh, a 2,048 unit portfolio. It's eight properties across Dallas-Fort Worth that we're going to be rolling out here in the next week or two. Uh, it's, it's, I think, a, a great opportunity uh, for what Darwin does and what this group does in that uh, it's a 25, 30 year ownership they're out of the country, they're based in Canada, and they've owned these properties for 25 and 30 years, and they've maintained them well, and all the staff are there long term. But what they haven't done is any improvement to the property to bring them into the modern era. So they're clean, but you walk in there, it's like a time capsule going back to 1986. So, and the rents are 1986 rents too. So, uh, you know, you're talking two to $300 below market you know, where these rents are versus uh, where you can get today if you were to put money into them. So we're really excited to be rolling that out. That'll be about 155 or so million dollar offering. 
and then we've got several other individual projects that we'll be rolling out in the next couple weeks as well. All right, perfect. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks for coming out, Al. It really is funny as a seller, you want all that competition and everything else as a buyer, it's absolutely freaking ridiculous. Absolutely hate it. You bid against yourself. It's horrible. All right, any other questions on woodwind? Oh, let me, we'll talk about that later. Uh, any other questions on woodwind? Okay. Again, a learning experience on what, what we think about. Yes, sir. Is, is the listing online yet? Is it online yet? Hey, Al, yeah. is it online yet? List is no woodwind. www.silvamultifamily.com. And yes, it is online. Okay. And it went live today as a uh, should have had an email blast to everybody. But if you go on Silva um, Multifamily, you can register on there and then you get put on the list and he sends everything out to everybody anyway. So you can see the same type of stuff that we see. Sometimes my favorite broker will let me know about things a little bit early. So, uh, so but, uh, but now I'm sure he's got a lot of favorite buyers. So um, no one more favorite than me, thank you. And he's running for Congress, so he'll accept donations, yes. Okay, the next one. Who's partners on Tribeca? Everybody's so damn excited. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we just had an email go out on that. Again, I want everybody to learn about what we do while we're doing it. So it's, we try and sell the good, the bad, and the ugly, and everything that's going on. Tribeca is going great, and we're in a position where we had to decide whether we wanted to sell it or refinance it. Okay, selling it was a great uh, opportunity to go ahead and I think it was 160% or 60%. If you put in 100 grand, you got 160 back, okay, after some distributions and owning it for 18 months, something like that. Either way. Now there's that option, and then you get that, you take that, take the funds. And you pay taxes on those, which is always fun. And then you have to find a place to go reinvest those funds at, okay? Or we refinance it. And we refinance it. We could do a max cash out, which is getting, uh, we had a valuation from the lender. I want to say it was $15 million. What's our all in on that? eight or nine million dollars, something like that. So um, $16 million valuation, $15 million valuation, and we could get a max refi and pull a lot of cash out of it, but it would kill any distributions, okay? And in killing distributions, that also puts at us a very high break even point on that property, which puts the property at risk which is not something I'm willing to do. So the max refinance is kind of off the board. So now we have a choice, sell it, or we had another option on the refinance. If we did a 65% loan to value, we could still cash out and give partners about $30,000 back on their $100,000 investment, okay? And do a 12 year loan with five years of interest only, okay? I think I told everybody I was anticipating 425 to 4.3% interest on that. We actually did a rate lock on that today at 4.21% interest. So 4.21% interest, interest only for five years and a loan for 12 years. What that does is that puts us in a great position long term for great cash flow. Okay. So that is what we did on Tribeca. Okay. Thank you. Partners that want it like getting money back. Okay, again, something new. On Brookside, who's partners on Brookside? When do you anticipate closing Tribeca? Tribeca, we are planning on February 5th as far as completing the refinance. So by the end of February, having distributions out on that. 
Brookside. Okay, for those of you who are partners on Brookside, we had to raise money for Pioneer and Brookside at the same time. Pioneer, more of a value play. Brookside, more of a yield play. <clears throat> we were raising money for both of those at the same time. We had to raise $14 million at the same time for those two properties. Jeremy, who was on the phone talking to everybody and working pretty constantly, so he says, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, he ended up raising uh, about $13 million, okay, which is a Herculean task and great job for, on that. However, from my point of view, we're a million dollars short, okay? So I, got, I had the opportunity to solve a problem and do something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I started a separate company, but what I did is I started that new company and put a million dollars into it. And that million dollars, actually I put in, a, uh, we were actually a million four because of some timing issues. So I put the million dollars in that company, million four in that company, and used that as the final partner on Brookside. Okay, so that's what I did. So really technically I've got a million five or so in that property myself. What Ulfbert Capital is going to be doing is they're gonna be a buyer for shares of LLCs. They're gonna bridge the gap on capital raises, meaning that if we're raising something like that again, they'll come in and fund the rest of it, okay? So if we need $6 million, we only end up with five. No problem, I'll put in the extra, extra little bit and we can sell that off later if we want to or I hold on to it either way, okay? It also means that we're developing a way of providing some liquidity for your shares on other properties. Okay. That's where you make the ooh noise according, according to Jeremy. Everybody says it's a five-year CD. Yeah. Okay, so because he, he apparently gets complaints that it's a five-year CD, you're locking your money up. Yes, you are. Okay. It's an illiquid investment. But I'm going to add some calculations into my numbers to say what Ulfbert will buy your share for. Okay, so that can give you some benchmarks. I've got benchmarks in there as far as if you have $100,000 invested, what that is worth right now. Okay, we'll go through that calculation later on. And if you want to sell that share then, then I, again, it's not great, but it's a starting point that Ulfbert will buy it at 85% of the value right then because it's an illiquid investment. That's the way that we're setting that up. Um, also, if anybody wants to turn and just have a fixed income investment and just say, forget it, uh, all these properties are a pain in the butt, I don't like having all of these, they can just get an 8% fixed return by investing in Ulfbert, okay? And then that's just a fixed income annuity type of thing and it's just 8% fixed automatic. And, and I'm the one that does the initial funding on that. Okay, so A, a way of providing some liquidity for those of you who wanna buy or sell uh, additional shares, a fixed income opportunity. But again, the one thing that I have on record right now, so everybody knows, is that Ulfbert is me, and so I am investing in, in those shares in other ways. Okay, so you know that, again, I want to disclose that it's me that's doing that. Now, also, if you have other partnership interests in other LLCs that you wanna sell, then I can analyze though and give you an offer on buying those shares as well. Follow? Any questions? Simple, easy breezy. Okay, this is something else that's exciting. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy has in been in the dark on all of this. He didn't even know Jeff was talking. <laughs> Frankfurt Station Lofts. Okay, going back to Woodwind. The partner that I was bringing on is a lender and a construction company. And they were going to build the other side of Woodwind. Well, as they were looking at this, they had this other opportunity to build Frankfurt Station Lofts. This is right there in Carrollton off of uh, Frankfurt 35. They're putting in a new DART station there, et cetera. 
and there's some new construction. Um, and so that's why I was a little bit slow played on woodwind or we were on woodwind is because they were saying, wait a minute, which one should of these should we do first? And they liked the numbers and decided to do Frankfurt station lofts first. Well, I've been in communication with them and they need a, uh, an apartment expert to come in there to beef up their resume and to, um, help put the whole deal together, et cetera. So, they are funding a lot of it. The owner of the land is kicking in the land worth, I forget how much it is, three to $5 million. Um, the other company is kicking in cash. So they want me to come in and be the management side, the, um, as far as the apartment side and putting together the investment. So they're gonna want me to raise some capital for Frankfurt Station Lofts. Now again, I've never built before, but I like this because who in here wanted to be a lead, okay? And of those, are you KPs or loan guarantors? No, are, okay, and you need to do that so that you have your card, right? So you, you have your Fannie Mae card to go get Fannie Mae loans. You need experience to get experience and how that happens, who, who knows? So you do that by being a KP on somebody else's loan to get that. It's a similar thing with the development. Now I'm going in with them, they're, the main players, but now I get my development card and there's other opportunities for development that I can do. For example, Woodwind, I, if we would have had that second after doing this one, then I could have developed that without their assistance. You follow? Okay, so this year we're anticipating building Frankfurt Station Lofts. 200 units and uh, we have not finalized all the returns of the whole transaction, et cetera but that is something that we, they're putting up 50, 60, 70% of the capital and they're gonna want my assistance on putting together the private placement memorandum and raising the rest of the money. So that'll be a fun thing. Any questions on that? Crickets, crickets, crickets. What would we, what would you be buying or what would we be investing in? Oh, and, and when we go through and do that, it's the same type of thing. It's the same type of LLC where, it is, where it's going to be rather than buying the apartment, it's going to be building the apartments. So it's 18 months to two years before there's any return. But then hopefully, at least in the, in the plan, but then there's a whole lot greater gain on that return um, from the original building. Yes, sir. Then the business model is to lease it up and sell it, correct. And what's funny is there's the insurance companies now paying uh, three, three and a half caps on properties. So if our construction cost, including land on this, I don't remember it is off the top of my head. Let's just say it's $140,000. It might sell for $180,000, $190,000 a door, who knows. There's another question? What's your time frame? Yes, ma'am. Can't hear you. When am I going to have a PPM? That's, gonna, that's not going to be for a little while. We're still finalizing our deal, getting all the numbers finalized, getting the final bids, because we've already had soil tests and construction drawings and approval from the city. And that's what they've been working on until now. And now that they're ready to go, uh, if we finalize it, once we finalize it, they're looking at being able to break ground the end of February. So this will be with all of the entitlements and everything already done and ready to go. Shovel ready. Okay, here's the information everybody wants to know. Okay. And I can't stand up here. It's impossible for me. Okay. So here's the every property. Okay, the crossing. And I'm sure we don't have any crossing partners in here because I did it so long ago. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give disclosure on something else here on the crossing. Okay. The crossing, I did that. We bought that uh, almost five years ago. And that is one property that Kelly and I manage. I've got to tell you, I haven't sent out a report in two years. I haven't sent out an email to everybody in two years. Um, I don't get a single phone call <laughs> from them. Um, it operates smooth, easy, no problems whatsoever. 
and we've so far for a hundred thousand dollar investment okay let's take this straight across okay crossing 101 units bought it in 2013 status we're holding on to it the total cash paid to a hundred thousand dollar investor so far i've already paid him 146 thousand dollars that's the main reason people don't call me on that and they don't care about anything and then, even, even then, the money that was sent out this year we've, for that property, I think, is about, for a $100,000 investor, I, I think they probably got about $14,000 even now after getting all their money back. Okay. A couple of big things. Notice we've had it now for five years. That's one of the reasons why you buy and hold, is these things get better and better and better and better with age. Okay. Now the value, this is where I put in there, the estimated value of what that $100,000 partner's value is in that property is $156,000, okay? So it's still worth $156,000 even after getting $146,000 back, okay? The way that that <clears throat> is calculated, we take the estimated value of the property Okay, now there are cap rate values, et cetera, but what I'm using is a market price per unit of what that property should sell for, running nice and smooth and easy if it, as of today, okay? Then we subtract out 6% sales costs, which is just a round number for estimating. Then we subtract out um, the loan amount and come up with a total dollar value. We take that total dollar value. Now, does anybody remember how our calculations work for your for partners? The way that that works is first, the partners get whatever they need to be to get $100,000, their original cash investment back. And then it's a split between class A and class B members. Meaning that then it, so we don't participate as sponsors until you have 100% of your cash back. <clears throat> Kelly, can you give me some water? Um, then, so what that then calculates is that adds in that calculation. If I just took the total amount of the equity times the ownership percentage, then that number is lower, okay? So we're saying that then combining the total cash paid so far plus what the value is right now gives a total return of $302,000, which is 56% or 12.2% annualized. Okay. Is 12.2% per year annualized a good return? Yeah? It's not as good as 20. <laughs> but that's good, especially, especially if you want to look at that considering they've already got $146,000 back. Okay, so yeah, 12% might be able to do better, but everybody is thrilled. <coughs> Park Row. Now we're a little skewed on Park Row. Okay, the value that I've used there, we've got to decide whether we're going to sell it or refinance it. So who are Park Row partners? Okay. Al Silva, who sold us the property has done a broker's price opinion on that property. He's saying in the current state of the property, based on the net operating income, that it's only worth $13,500,000. At $63,000 a door, okay? It's entirely too low, okay? That should be at least 15, maybe $16 million. The reason for the discrepancy between those two values is because of, what did you learn earlier? Mm, let's go with NOI as well. He's determined that value is so far, one of the things that I have been perturbed with the management company on is our expenses on that property are way too high. That's why we have not put it on the market to sell it is it's out of whack. It doesn't show well right now at that number. That should be at least $80,000 a door. Okay, not $63,000 a door. Yeah, what's, what's Tarrant County's property tax? 
Okay. What's Tarrant County's ball? Yeah, they, they wanted to tax it at $16 million. Okay. I'm going to go back to something Jeff went over. Remember the DeLorean slide? The NOI was $100,000 and the cap rate was 10, saying that the property was worth a million dollars. And five years later, the NOI is still $100,000, but the cap rate's 5%. So it's worth $2 million. This is very, very, very important. I want you to hear this. Okay, make sure you pay attention to this part of it. That is not too far out of whack on what's happened over the last five years. Okay, the cap rates have gone down, increasing the value of the properties. Okay, so when you hear all these people making all this money, the NOI could still be the same. It can still be the same shitty property five years later with the same NOI means that they didn't fix anything, didn't do anything, same NOI. But because of the cap rates going down, it increased the value of the property. You follow that? Okay. Now, that NOI could have not gone up Part of the reason, obviously, could have been for poor management, but a big thing that we're finding right now is the property taxes in Tarrant County have been a killer, okay? So if we increase the collections, let's just say we increase our NOI from, uh, using that same example, from 100,000, we increase the rents $50,000. Is the property worth more? Yes. Now, because the market's going so well, the cap rates go down, okay? So now the property is worth more because of cap rates going down and additional collections. Well, guess who then turns around and says, hey, that property's worth a lot more. We gotta tax you a lot more. So that $150,000 in, that $50,000 increase in income it is not unreasonable to say that your property taxes went up $40,000 because it went from a million dollars to $2 million just because of cap rate compression. Okay, the thing was, I thought we were in a non-disclosure state. Okay, it's absolutely correct. We are in a non-disclosure state, which all that means is that it doesn't have to be disclosed to the state. However, the state wants that information because that's how they adjust their taxes. So they can subscribe to the same services we all do to get the data in the first place. Okay. I think they're even an investor or partner with CoStar that when you buy or sell a property, you'll get 50 phone calls from analysts at CoStar saying, oh, you just sold that property or you just bought that property or you were the broker on that property. Let me get some, for, for comp reasons, let me go ahead and get that information. And one of, somebody's gonna tell them what it is. So even though we're a non-disclosure state, they still wanna find out the information and they do. Okay, it's a racket. Okay. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, and this is another thing. Yeah, the note, when you refinance, that's why we've timed some of our refinances so that, because when you refinance, the loan is a public record and they go ahead and just back into it by the value of the loan to come up with how much the appraisal should have been of how you just got that. Okay, it's all crap. Getting back to Park Row. The broker, because the NOI, I don't wanna throw people under the bus. Um, the ex prop, Park Row has had expense problems as a result of what I would say is ineffect ineffective management. Because of that, our expenses are high. They haven't been able to hold on to uh, employees, so we've had a lot of temporary services, things like that. That's just part of it. The tax is going up, et cetera. Our expenses are out of whack there. If we were to get the expenses in line, the property is worth, um, at least $80,000 a unit. I put in there $85,000 a unit. However, when we bought it, we did not paint the property. 
we did not, we have not improved all of the units. So I want to take you a different direction. For those of you who are owners on Park Row, we can sell it now and for your $100,000 investment, you've already received $60,000. You'd receive another 145 if you sold it. Not too bad, but nowhere near good enough, okay? If we turned around and refinanced it, pulled cash out, gave cash back, I wanna say that was in the 40%, another 40% range, okay? So we refinance it, give you another 40,000 back on your 100. We put addition, part of the proceeds we use to paint the property, finish through the interiors, and hopefully Ken, you're not on the spot or anything, Ken, um, he can lower the expenses and get this back in line. And if we do that, then it's worth $80,000, $85,000 a unit. And now that total value, rather than being um, a total return of 46%, it goes up to like 240, which is the projection that we've used before. So one, Park Row Partners, raise your hand real quick. Okay. Do we sell it at the lower value? Is that, is that a vote? Okay. Do we refinance it, put the money back into it, and increase the, increase the price, increase the value? Okay. Now, if the vote would have been to sell it, then my suggestion was, because if this property came on the market, if Al listed that and said, hey, we've got a property, Park Row Apartments, at $63,000 a unit, I'd want to buy it. <laughs> Okay, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to sell it at that because there's the upside. If there's partners that want to sell, then that's why we have Altberg Capital in there to say, hey, you know what? We can now do this and, and, uh, and adjust this so that if people want to sell, Tribeca, there was only two partners out of 25 that voted to uh, refinance it. Two partners said sell it. Okay, so if you're interested in selling it, then we now have an avenue to help with that. Okay, so that's Park Row. Woodwind we just talked about. Again, I think we're tapped out as far as where we are unless we build. And I don't want to build raising our own funds because it is something that I have not personally done before. I would love to, but I can't. Yes, sir. Real quick, if you refi and we pull another 40 out of it, will that kill distributions? No. The question is if we refinance it, pull 40 out, will that kill distributions? It will not kill distributions. And because of That's even better. And because of the additional capital, that allows us to put more money into the property, which lowers our expenses and increases our income. Okay. Woodwind, like I said, okay, we're tapped out. Annualized, 23% per year. Okay, the $100,000 investment. Paid $10,000 so far. Not great cash flow, but increased the value of those shares to $165,000. Total 23% annualized. Sunset Heights, who's in Sunset Heights? Pat, your, <laughs> pat yourself on the back. Um, Sunset Heights, obviously we've uh, $100,000 investment already given back almost $68,000. Not too bad, huh? Um, for bought in December 2015. Okay. And the value of those same shares, even after it's 67, is $146,000. Okay. So another 23%. Villa Creek. Giving back $42,000 on 100 so far, and the value of those shares are still 134. Okay, nothing really going on on any of those properties. Halenani, our little property in Hawaii, okay. Here's what's going on on that. Okay, the value is up, and we do want to refinance, and we do have cash flow. We are still waiting on getting the solar system, the solar electric installed. 
we now have heard from about the fifth or sixth different person from that company saying that, oh, it's, we, should we should have more information in March. <laughs> more information is not a decision if you noticed how it was phrased. Okay, now that increases our collections by, I don't remember, I don't even remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it drastically, it lowers our electric cost increases our income quite a bit, drastically increases the value of the property, which will allow us to refinance more. So we're just waiting on that one, okay? Tribeca, we've talked about that as far as refinancing uh, that, which will be in March, okay? Um, Sedosa is, there's only one partner on Sedosa. Um, Las Lomas, Riverbend, and Brookside. Those, I'm gonna use the term still baking. They're still in the oven, okay? I had a partner on a property that we were still early and he's like, I don't like this, where this is going. I'm scared. I want to get out. You know, let's do it. And I'm saying, it's still in the oven. And, you know, I'm trying to use a, some type of example I can come up with to, to have it make sense. You know, you're not going to pull your cake out of the oven before it's done. You got to wait until it bakes properly. Because when we buy these, you got to remember we're buying them with the plans of increasing that income to get that new value. So we're buying it for X, putting Y into it, anticipating having a value of Z. Well, that's gonna dip down a little bit before it goes up because the money that we're putting into the property has not translated into higher occupancy and higher income yet. So on a short term, there's a little dip. So that's where we are with Las Lomas, Riverbend, and Brookside. But obviously Brookside, we just closed. End of October, End of October? so two months, okay? Any questions on any of these? I must be brilliant at explaining things. Okay, the question is, are we seeing something blanket or are we seeing an individual triggering event? Both, okay? That triggering event is having them raise everything to be level with that one. We're saying, hey, if that one sold for $80,000 a unit, then all these other ones should be worth $80,000 a unit. So it's not that they're targeting one property, but they're using individual properties to establish the overall market. And they're trying to push it up in that direction. Sir. Since we did a refi on Sunset Heights last year, do you expect to get hit with much higher taxes this year? Um, I, the, in my opinion, the, I'll repeat the question. Okay, on Sunset Heights, because we did the refi, are we expecting a higher tax bill this year because of that refinance? First off, they're gonna go up every year. I'm, I'm feeling as though this year, they won't be as aggressive because they've been so aggressive the last couple of years. They had to get that up to a certain level because really the problem is they're keeping up, the houses are real easy to adjust. So the value of the houses have gone up in a different ratio than what the commercial properties have gone up. And so with the state looking at the individual taxing authorities, they're saying, hey, wait a minute, your house are gone way up, but your commercial has gone up. So it's not fair because everybody that owns a house is saying, wait a minute, mine's gone way up, but that commercial property hasn't. It's taxed at $20 million and it just sold for 50. Why, what the heck? So those ratios, they needed to really beef up the commercial properties to get their, their ratios in line with the state. And that's mainly because Tarrant County was really out of whack. So they've really been pushing that the last couple of years. So I think they're getting more in line with where they should be. So I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that they're not as aggressive because, but I have a feeling that they're not going to be quite as aggressive as they have. Any other questions on this? All right, good. Overall, 12 .2, 14.9, 23.7, 23.2, 19.5, 22.7, 41.1, .1, and 14.6. Is everybody happy with their returns? Well, thank you, all four of you. I appreciate it. How many partners do I have, Jeremy? 425. 
We have 425 partners now. You know what I didn't talk about? Well, that's next on the list, but there was stuff up there in the earlier part of, as far as what I was going to tell you about, um, the software we're going to invest in. I told you a year and a half ago, I think it was, that we were that we invested in in Salesforce and that we we're developing it so that you can track your investments more. Um, I've probably spent thirty six, maybe sixty grand, trying to develop that, and I haven't gotten anywhere. Okay, that kind of sucks. Okay. Um, but we are looking at a software. It's very expensive, but it does most everything that we want it to do to make it better for you so that it's like you can go on there and look at it like you're looking at an E-Trade account or uh, your por stock portfolio, something like that. So you can look at it online so that you can manage your distributions, ACH them, get an email that they've been sent to you. Um, look at the value of your properties, consolidated, individual, have all the reports on there. So rather than getting an email with a link to them, you'll get an email stating that these things are gone out, that X amount has been deposited into your account for that property. And if you want to look at the reports to go ahead and log on to the system to go ahead and get all those, which will have all of your original documents, the PPM, financials, rent rolls, all the documents for you, okay? Now that is not cheap, and I'm, I get no benefit out of it whatsoever, okay? That's only to try and make things better for you guys. And I'm gonna go ahead and throw, with every conversation I've had with Ken, with Brian, with Jeremy, with Brian Johnson, with everybody, our whole goal, it, the bottom line what, that I say every single time is whatever's best for the investors. That's the whole thing. That's how we keep moving ahead. Okay, and I mean that completely sincerely. As far as what's best for you guys, in the ultimate long run will be what's best for me. Okay, so just FYI. All right, exit strategies. And it's 827. I'm going to do this real, real fast. Let's get the platitudes. Platitudes, is it saying? What is the right word? Uh, begin with the end in mind. Have a plan with multiple outcomes. Bud Again, for budgetary purposes, I use a five year plan. That's it. And that's just so that I can have a beginning, a middle, and an end to what the plan is. And that's what I budget for. However, the market's going to go up and down. Okay. And my opinion is you get rich buying and selling real estate, you get wealthy buying and holding on to, owning long-term that real estate. You can look at the returns on Saginaw Crossing and show that. And uh, so our goal is to hold on to it. The only, I actually look more for a reason, I have to have a compelling reason to sell a property rather than having that as a business plan as a lot of people do. Okay, because I would rather hold on to it long term for that cash flow. <clears throat> it is not a liquid investment, which is why we're trying to add Ulfbert Capital in there to help overcome that objection for you. And if you sell a property, what the heck are you going to do with the money anyway? Okay, I will tell you from experience. Let's see, how old was I? 28 years old, I think it was 28. And I had been buying and selling properties and, and uh, because I was using my own capital, I had to do that to turn that capital and do all that. And I ended up getting to a certain level and I sold a property in 2008. Okay, so I wasn't 28, I was much older. Um, <laughs> I was trying to say young and dumb, but nope, I can't say that. Um, but I sold the property and I walked out of closing with a check for over a million dollars. I sold that property at a million dollars in cash. Okay. And I wish I would not have done that. <laughs> I turned around and I had a million dollars that I've got to invest this because I've got to keep this growing. Okay. 
I invested in somebody else's home building business in 2008. Oh. There went 250 grand. I bought a new house. There went some more money. I did this, did this, did this, and pissed most of it away. Okay. I like that it is illiquid. I like knowing that I can't go blow it on something stupid because I have the money in the bank. I like that it's earning money long term and it's hard to get to. I remember a financial planner said, uh, cut up all your credit cards, take one emergency credit card and freeze it in a block of ice in your freezer. <laughs> so that if you ever have to charge anything, you have to go out there and chisel that thing out, use a blow dryer to get to it to really make you think before you spend that money. Okay, so that, that's kind of what I like about this is it's tied up, it's growing, and I can't screw it up. So, and even if we sold, what are you gonna do with that money? Because now you're gonna buy, I like the example, a buddy of mine had a house in California, he paid 300 grand for it. It went up to $500,000. And he said, oh my God, I can make $200,000 to sell the house. So he sold the house, made $200,000 and went and realized that every other house that he would buy would be $500,000 and ended up buying a house, four houses down for, five, for that $500,000. Okay, so where are you gonna put the money? And if it's gone up, it's gonna have the same problems. Just like Park Row, the thought process is, is there additional upside? Have we, have we maxed out what it is? Okay, is it ready to sell? The financials, are they ready? Is it prepared and show it ready to sell because of how it's been prepared? A lot of times you need to prepare it. A lot of times sellers will put lipstick on a pig just to make it look good and fudge the financials to make that look better so that they could sell it and get the most money for it. I'm not a proponent of that personally. Or are there market conditions that will affect the property value? Azelwood. There's a total of 180 units in the entire city. Yet some moron decides to build 220 brand new units in the same city. There's only 180 now. Where is he going to get the other 220 to fill up his property? Well, he's going to have to cut his rents drastically and steal from the other properties, which could only hurt us on that property. So we said, let's sell it. A little fun fact. You remember my seller on Pioneer, our seller on Pioneer, the worst operator and horrible person ever? He's the one that actually bought Azelwood. I heard from the broker that after he bought it, he went out there to look at it. And went, holy crap, what's this new construction going on across the street? Okay. So a little bit of a saving grace. Um, are there physical conditions that cannot be rectified that will affect the value? Okay. For example, it, do you have uh, rotting pipes underneath the foundation that's going to be a huge capital expense? Do you have something that you can't prepare for financially that you're saying, hey, we should get out of this? Okay. That's another reason of why you, should, why you might want to consider selling. Azelwood, like we talked about. Sell or refi. Refi notes was not an option because that new, construct, that new competition would hurt the property too much. We also thought that our rents were topped out. They could only go down with that new competition, at least in the short term. Okay. The expenses could have, become, could have been lower with better management, but it's not enough to offset the problems uh, with that new competition. So that one was an easy decision. I'm not even sure we put that up for vote, did we? Only 19 partners out of the 425. And that, that one new unit that was added didn't offset all that? No, it helped, but it didn't offset all that, no. Um, Tribeca. Now, this one gets down to personal preference. Do you want to sell it and get your money out? Uh, sell, refinance, or hold on to it. There's rental growth possible. There's expense reduction, definitely. 
But if we sell it now, a $100,000 investor would get 159,000. Okay, quick sidebar. Do you like that I break it down to what a $100,000 investor would get on this stuff? Does, is that more relatable? Okay. Okay, so, um, so if we sell it, they could get $159,000. A maximum refi is not an option. Uh, I said, forget it, you can't do that because if there's any hiccups, we would all get hurt and it would kill the cash flow. 65% refi would be great for a long-term hold. It'd only get $38,000 cash back, but it gets us in great position long-term for more growth, um, hopefully better expenses. And uh, with that nice note on there, um, gives us great cash flow. And if we just held it, just cruising on just like it was, it was tying up too much equity. So the vote is a personal preference. Do we sell or do we refinance? We put that out for vote of about 40 partners or so. I think we had about 25 people reply. I have no idea what was going on with the other ones, whether they read emails or not. Um, but two people said vote, 23% said let's refi and hold that long term. Okay, so that was the, again, this is one of those that was a preference. Do you wanna do this or do you wanna do this? So let's put it out for a straw poll. And it was overwhelming support for the refi. So we said, okay, we're doing the refi. Park Row, this is the one that we're we have to decide right now. Do we sell it or refi? Okay, just humming along regular isn't really gonna work. When we bought it, we did not plan on painting the property. So we've got paint that's needed, wood replacement that's needed. Um, we need to take care of those CapEx. So if we sell it, $100,000 investor gets $148,000 on that lower value, okay? or we refinance it and pull out $49,000 on $100,000 investment. However, if we refinance it, put that money back into it like we talked about, back up step. I wanna make sure I understand. When we refinance and I say give $49,000 back, that includes, let me phrase, that is the net number after when I said hold back money for fixing up the property. Whenever I do any numbers like that, I try and do that as a net number back to you on everything. So if a question, I would have a question, well, is that um, refi $49 include or not include the CapEx that we're gonna put back into it? Or are you gonna say, hey, we need to give some more money back on it? No, that $49,000 is what would be back on a refi after we set aside, I wanna say, under five hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars to put back into the property. Okay. But also, for those that don't know, uh, forty-nine is on top of the first refi, right? Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, that's forty-nine thousand dollars back now on top of the refi that we already did. That was fifty-five thousand dollars back on the original hundred thousand dollar investment. Okay. But the broker is saying Al in running the numbers, he's saying it's the property is worth sixty-three thousand dollars a unit. And that should be at least 80,000, maybe $85,000 a unit fixed up, okay? So real quick, Park Row Partners. If you're a Park Row Partner, raise your hand. That's it, six of us, seven? Okay, if you think it's a sell, keep your, put your hand up. Sell Park Row, just sell it as is. No, or refinance it. Okay. I know this is this is big. It's high finance here. Okay, so there was a lot more, but there was only one for sell it. But there's thirty nine. This is just a straw poll, just for me to get an idea. Exit strategy is always keeping your always keep your options open. By the way, debt is a protection. Okay, I don't know if this makes any sense to you. Uh, no neutron loans. Neutron loan explodes, kills all the people, leaves the property. Okay, that's where you have a loan that's due and payable in two years or one year. You don't want to do those. Um, we get non-recourse debt and a fixed interest rate. I don't like these variable things. 
we're locking in, for example, on Tribeca, 4.21% interest. Okay, A, that shorts the dollar dramatically. It also protects us. So you said that you know that cap rates, they go down, the value goes up. Well, if the cap rates go up, the value goes down. Cap rates also are affected by the prevailing interest rates. So if interest rates go up, the cap rate goes up and the value goes down. Having a 12 year loan gives us the a hedge against cap rates going up because the yield the investor gets is still good because they can assume that 4.21% loan. We've got a 12 year loan. We've got a long period of time that somebody can go in there and assume that loan. So if interest rates go up to 10%, and you can assume a 4.21% loan? Is there a value there? Yes. Okay, so that's a hedge. Um, the other thing is you gotta make sure that you're properly capitalized in the whole scenario. Markets go up and down, you can't time the top, be prepared to go through the market dips, okay? It's gonna go up and down, but it's gonna go up and down long term like that. You try and top it, you're not, it's not gonna work. Every time is a good time to buy, every time is a good time to sell. Um, however, our strategy is long-term hold. Any questions? Yes, sir. It's a it's a thirty-year amortization after the first five years. Yes. On a refinance. Okay, when you're talking about pulling money on the refinance, that is. Get the blurb in here, make sure to check with your CPA regarding the rules, I'm not a CPA, yada, 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 yada. But that is getting your original investment back, that's return of capital, so that is generally not taxed, okay? Now, after you get all your capital back, then that is taxed, okay? But we also still have depreciation that would write off that part of it. So yes, on a refinance, that is generally tax-free. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When you uh, said that you were switching management companies and you were no longer with Walker Holder, were you referring to your own uh, in-house team as, as uh, doing the management from, from here in? For him, from okay, here? when, um, okay, I'm not gonna repeat the question, but I'll get it in the answer. We terminated Walker Holder and that, oh, let me, I didn't throw something else in here. In December, Vicki, our property supervisor, gave notice to Walker Holder to start her own management company, which means there was a change in supervision anyway. And because there was a change in the management of a key person overseeing our assets, that helped push along the necessity to make the decision to get a new management company. Okay, so what I meant by my team, it's the team that's been in place Ken has always been a third party asset manager and he also has a management company. So the management company is still gonna be third party. I don't have any ownership in that. That is Ken's company, okay? So it's not brought in house, it's still a third party management company, okay? Any other questions? Going, going, yes sir. Have you ever discussed the overall market conditions of the assets or how the real estate market is ever doing? Do I ever discuss how the real estate market is doing or specific assets? With, with multifamily and how the new tax law and those type things are affected. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is the forum for that. Okay. Um, this is his first time here and he's asking whether or not we talk about market conditions, things like that, or even tax law, et cetera. Right. Now that comes in. Uh, yes, um, we do go through all that. We try and be an open book on everything and get you whatever information. It would have been great to have a CPA come in to explain what changes this will affect for us. However, we already had it set up for uh, exit strategy and giving this information. Um, so yes, we will have that information and we will discuss it in the meetings. Yes, sir. Uh, February, we're trying to bring in a CPA like we did last year. Okay. Okay, so next month, I want to make sure to point this out. Two things on that. Okay. 
Next month, I won't be here. So handling this will be Jeff and Jeremy and Brian, and they're looking at having a CPA come in to go in and discuss certain things. But we're also starting a different group. Well, let me see. Let me see if you would be interested in this. Um, setting up a, I'm going to call it a passive investor network group. Okay. Ping, there you go. <laughs> and that is without me there, but just so that you guys can talk amongst yourselves and try and come up with best practices, things like that. I'm not looking for a bitch session. Um, I'm looking for proactive, uh, a productive meeting so that you guys can discuss what you like or dislike that I am doing, that somebody else is doing on things that we can change or improve our communication, um, what you like, what you see, um, or even compare other properties or other investments, you know, things like that. And that's going to be up to you guys. And that will be, like I said next week, spearhead by Brian Holly, Jeff Young Love, Young Love, not a glove, love. Um, and uh, Jeremy, and hopefully have um, a CPA here. And that will be February 13th, okay? Pre-Valentine's Day, okay? <laughs> so I will not be here, but uh, hopefully everybody, it'll be the same place, February 13th, okay? Any other questions? Yes, sir. For year-end valuations for IRA investors, who do we send them? Um, unfortunately, you send those to me, um, and I will either do them or get them to the right place. For IRA valuations, by the way, I generally just put the same value that you use for investments because it's an illiquid investment. It goes up and down in value. There's not a ready marketplace for it. So it's, it's the same value of, of what you uh, invested in as far as the question was valuations for IRAs, et cetera, that need to be done. Questions? Anything else? Going, going. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Be sure to visit us at darwingerman.com. Make sure to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos.